Spare a thought for the poor babies of this world. All they're trying to do is make sense of everything going on around them, a never-ending barrage of words and sensations surrounded by a whole world of confusing stimuli. Yet somehow they managed to put it all together, walking and talking within three years. Babies are learning machines. Yet judging from the majority of so-called developmental toys and videos, they're only capable of understanding music if it's delivered in ludicrously simplified doses. Toy companies turn out bleeping junk, shaped like musical instruments under the guise of making learning fun. While TV and internet channels produce musical content that is sometimes of shockingly poor quality. There's also a strange prejudice against sharp notes. Like what's wrong with sharp notes? Where we expect babies to crack the incredibly complex nuances and semiotics of speech on the one hand, on the other, our musical expectations seem no higher than the ability to mimic do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So in this video, I'm calling out the assumptions I think are incorrect and who I think the worst offenders are. So I should probably mention that my household has recently expanded to include twin boys who are now four months old. So I have a horse in this race, and I'm surprised at the lack of teaching literature relevant to this age group. And don't worry, I'm not going to go crazy on you blasting all nursery rhymes and musical toys out there. When well crafted, they can be educational and entertaining, but I do find myself scratching my head when I'm unable to find a glockenspiel that has 12 notes to the scale and more than one octave. I just want to play my babies the Back to the Future theme. Okay, here I am in my studio. Back to the Future. Let's do this. So when sharp notes are removed, the instrument is suddenly limited to one key, C major, and therefore it's not possible to play a wrong note if we're judging by early 19th century standards. But why do this? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is marketing. Adults who don't have any musical training will often think that harmonious sounding toys are more appropriate, because Lord knows dissonance is bad for babies. That they'd interpret this... Not for what it is, an interesting noise, but for something negative and frightening. Well, so far for me, the evidence for this is non-existent. No matter what chords or melodies I play to my babies, I've not yet managed to find a combination of notes that's upset them in any way whatsoever. Usually they just stare at me, fascinated with their eyes wide open. And for the skeptical, I'd say this. Any baby that's ever heard a washing machine, fan, hairdryer, hoover, or car engine has already been subjected to a level of dissonance far beyond the capabilities of any acoustic instrument. And if you've ever driven with your baby in the car and he didn't totally lose his mind with fear, then you're safe to play him some diminished fifths. And it's not like you have much choice anyway. I mean, check out the dissonance on this piece of crap. Another more understandable assumption is that we should start babies off only by exposing them to very simple things, that the introduction of musical complexity can happen as they grow older. But this is a missed opportunity when we consider how babies learn spoken languages. Research in this area emphasizes the importance of parents speaking or reading directly to their children as much as possible. This involves the use of complex sentences from day one, and from this babies pick up a feel for language, gradually understanding its purpose and its rule sets. They can discriminate all the sounds of all languages, no matter what country we're testing and what language we're using. And that's remarkable because you and I can't do that. We're culture-bound listeners. So the question arises, when do those citizens of the world turn into the language-bound listeners that we are? And the answer, before their first birthdays. Here's one study presented by Dr. Anne Fernald, the director of the Language Learning Lab at the Stanford Psychology Department that shows different stages of a child's development from 18 to 30 months. This example is of a child whose parents regularly spoke to him from birth. And you're going to see how he picks up speed in understanding. You'll see the stimulus underneath his picture. When the dots are red, he's on the wrong picture. When the dots are blue, he's moved to the right picture. Where's the doggy? Can you see it? Hey, okay, he did pretty good. Next, at 30 months, uh, it's great. He's, he's, he, he's, he nails it and he knows it and gives this cocky little smile. Where's the doggy? Can you find it? <laughs> We can see here that he's already begun to jump ahead of the request because he doesn't need to ponder the meaning of the first two words, where's the. He's gone as far as to deduce the direction of the sentence and has then combined it with a lightning quick assessment of his surroundings. I'm being told to look for something, I bet it will pop up on this screen. With a wider vocabulary, he's able to dedicate his brain to new problems. 
So with all this in mind, are we really saying that children with this level of brain sophistication can't handle five extra notes? Should we not be exposing them as quickly as possible to all kinds of keys, chord combinations and patterns so that they develop the same level of musical intuition during this unique once-in-a-lifetime learning period? In fact, why even expose them to only Western tonality? Why not Persian tonality, the gamelan, Vietnamese chamber music, microtonality, etc, etc? Well, thankfully, we don't have to leave that question unanswered. It's with a similar frame of mind that the musician Rick Beato decided to document his experiments with his own children, playing them an hour of complex music a day from birth. He found that doing this resulted in a dramatic improvement in his child's musical intuition. He's since released numerous videos where his son displays an astonishing level of tonal recognition and perfect pitch. Sing me a G minor chord. G, B, B, D. Okay, sing and name the notes in this chord. E, C, D, G, A, F sharp. So moving on, judging from a large portion of the products out there, another assumption that seems to underpin commercial attitudes towards musical education is that quality doesn't really matter because babies don't know any better. I've already mentioned those toys with cheap squawking speakers, but what about nursery rhyme channels on YouTube? Again, the quality here varies massively. Case in point, Hoopla Kids, a channel with millions of views and subscribers. Channels like these are a dime a dozen because the music is all public domain and all that's required is L-grade animation to convince parents it's worth watching. I mean, look at the state of that bell. Hopefully babies can take this warped perspective with a grain of salt. But there's loads of other lazy errors and problematic decision making going on here. Let's start with the minor one. So did you hear it? Well, the first bit is fine, but then they go rogue by shifting into what's called a relative minor key. I don't really understand this. When you repeat the phrase in minor, it sounds pensive, as if new information has just been delivered. I mean, are babies meant to question whether the wheels are really turning round and round? Is this a dark reimagining? For those thinking, this is just pointless nitpicking. Um, how do I say this? Uh, go to the back of the classroom, uh, I've ordered your dunce hat. If the creators of children's programming don't understand basic harmonic grammar and how musical language is constructed, then who knows what sort of bad lessons they're accidentally passing on to highly attentive babies. Let's look at Hoopla Kids' version of Five Little Ducks, a staple tune in teaching kids to count. Five little ducks went swimming one day Over the hills and far away Mommy duck said quack quack but only four little ducks came back. Okay, well, zipping forward, I hope I'm not spoiling the surprise when I tell you that this keeps happening. Each time the ducks come back, there's one less, and eventually none come back. Then they hit you with this creepy existential absurdity. No little ducks went swimming one day over the hills and far away. So I'm not really certain why they've decided to do this. Normally the format of the rhyme changes here with the mother duck getting off her arse to find the babies herself. It's not like they had to write anything new. And then they went and altered the ending. Oh, fantastic. And now we're enforcing gender stereotypes too. It takes the authority of a daddy duck to keep everyone in line. So in conclusion, when babies are able to eat, you don't start them off with fast food. When teaching them to speak, you don't teach them slang or garbled pronunciation. And if you came across a YouTube channel that claimed to help babies speak, and they pronounced things like Dalmatayan or Hungry, then you think this isn't good enough. So here are three rules of thumb I'm going to be using from now on. One, be selective about the stuff that's branded for kids. A lot of the time it's just incredibly low quality garbage made by complacent amateurs looking to make a bit of money. Two, don't be afraid to play music of all types to your kids. They have a learning genius before the age of one. And three, and I'm literally unable to find this contradicted anywhere, interacting with your children by banging on a drum or playing an instrument or singing to them in person trumps everything else. And if they display a love of music down the line, you'll know that you gave them the best possible helping hand. Now I'm going to go grab some hoisin sauce and a few spring onions, and you can be assured that no matter how much you quack quack, Daddy Duck's never coming back back. If you like my diatribe, subscribe!